whenever you're in an edge area, that's where you'll see more of these plants. So you're seeing Japanese knotweed, you're seeing multifloral. It's because this is an opening right here. Is there any place where you have branches that are crossing each other? You need to select one of them and take it out. So like up here where we can see this one curving, it's curving out towards, towards my left, I would cut that off right where it comes off. It all depends on what are your goals for a site. What permaculture brings to that is how do we accomplish those goals in a way that cooperates with how the earth works. From a deeper design perspective, meaning that the earth is in space, materials moved by gravity, and making use of gravity and passive energy is going to get us the most amount of mileage for the least amount of effort. And we're big into that kind of stuff. We like things like the designer as refinement. <laughs> like you make a garden dense enough so I could go out there and lie down and take a nap if you'd think I was doing something productive like weeding the parsnips. That's important in our design. <laughs> our designs need to be fun. Our designs need to be providing us with an opportunity to appear productive if actually being lazy. That's definitely a new one that I want to add. If you ever worked in a landscape where there's not much elevation, rise and drop, you'll understand why things like uplifted geologies are actually very valuable. And by having them lose their topographic distinction and reach the sea more rapidly than they would have by human deforestation, we're creating more work for ourselves once again in terms of catching, holding, and moving water through the landscape. Uh, one of the most electrical energy intensive things we do is move water around in the land. So 220 well pumps are going to be one of your biggest energy hogs in your conventional site development infrastructure. So you're beholden them to the grid, you're using 220, all to do something that you possibly could have done with gravity-fed rainwater cisterns that you situated off of your gutters from your building higher in the land. Energy cycling is based on this idea of catch, store, use, and cycle energy as many times as possible before it passes off of your site. And the ones that we've talked the most about are water and soil. So a series of, in an idealized landscape, we could have a little shed at the top, where perhaps we also have a tree over it. This shed will do some rainwater catchment, and overflow from that will go into our first swale, which is an on-contour swale, but then has a little pond at the end of it. And when this swale and this pond overflows, it goes into this swale, which then goes into this next little pond. And then when this pond overflows, it goes into this swale. But the other way we can do this, I mentioned in a place where there's already trees on it, is to come in where there's a log downhill, take that same log and put it on contour. The other thing this will do is it'll kickstart how much mycelial growth you'll get in this log, which as I was mentioning is a key part of forest health. It's also water retention, so it slows the rate at which the water disappears from the system and it gets it into more plants, more life, and more soil. In this country, for instance, we have insane zoning codes about how far apart you have to have every outlet on your wall, but we don't talk about things like where in so far it is possible a building shall make use of direct gain. That one simple thing would solve a huge amount of energy wastage that happens because we do not build paying attention to the sun. And if all you did was said, you know what, whenever you build a building, if you can make use of direct gain, it's a zoning requirement that you do so. Because if we made that a zoning requirement, then all of a sudden all new construction wouldn't be oriented towards the street, it'd be oriented towards the sun. And then direct gain in the wintertime would cut down dramatically on how much heat you need. You could also do passive solar hot water systems, which are upwards of 30% of your energy consumption in a building. So in really cold climates, we're going to focus on things like earth burn passive solar houses as a construction recommendation so that we then get that steady, steady state temperature of the ground, which the earth, as soon as you go below frost line, is always 45 to 52 degrees. So this is why earth burn passive solar houses became a very popular way to really maximize how comfortable your interior space stays with the least amount of inputs. It's one of the things we talk about with building designs in permaculture is give your, give your building clothes, which means that putting wraparound porches is an example of clothing on the house or sort of like clearly felt shades and things on your 
glass windows are going to be an example of clothing on the house, but so is a wraparound porch, because a wraparound porch is also a windbreak. So if you have a wraparound porch that goes on your northeast and west sides of your house, you've now created a buffer that gives your house that much more insulation value. But also on the north side of your porch, then you can have a insulated closet that in effect is a passive refrigerator because you have microclimates on your house um, and you want to make use of those microclimates and the north side of your house is a good place for cold storage. While refrigerators keep things a little bit too cold and they lose some of their nutritional value, a lot of dairy products, a lot of the flavor in food goes out as it gets to be too cold. So fridges, energy hogs, overused, it's worth brainstorming about passive ways that you can store food and keep food in good shape and there's nutritional reasons and energetic reasons why that's a good idea. So if you have springs, you could store your stuff in the spring because the spring is always going to be 45 to 52 degrees. Always. The other thing with springs that's so great is that springs are a backup for your drinking water also. So you're developing something that then you're plumbing to go to use for irrigation and domestic use, but then also if you should end up having your juice go down and you can't get water from your well, then you could go and you could get some drinking water from that spring. So when you're going to drink from a spring, what's important is that it's not a spring that's coming up somewhere else in the land, going underground, and then coming up again. Because then if you're drinking it from where it comes up again, there could be animal scat getting into it at the, at the other, the first place where it comes out of the ground. Retrofitting is also key, so that we, we cut down on how much energy consumption infrastructures need by making them more energy intelligent, energy effective, and then also switching to a mosaic or a hybrid of more regional energy production so that it's more energy Effective because this thing of sending energy over long distance is what the centralized grid is doing that's so wasteful. And fragmenting the ecosystems because you're building high tension electric lines to go all over the countryside that are going through some of our nicest, pristine national forests and wilderness areas. And the National Institute of Health estimates that people who live in proximity within a quarter mile of a high tension electric line are more prone to getting leukemia and immunodeficiency related diseases. So there's an EMF field that spirals off of a high tension electric line because it's losing 50% of its juice and transmission. That means there's a ton of electricity just coming off of this line all the time. But you can hear, if you stand underneath the high tension electric line on a really humid day, right? You hear that. And you can tell, like, whoa, that's a little weird. The idea also that we're going to be met, it's not necessarily like every building or every resident is going to have its own energy grid, but to have sort of maintenance plants that are like block sized in urban areas. So you would have a facility that has several different types of juice that's a hybrid system that comes into it. And you'll see this on a number of communities and homesteads where people are trying to figure out how to get a good steady supply of electricity throughout the entire season. This is all a hybrid system where they'll have a windmill, a micro hydro system, and solar panels. And what we're looking at in terms of transition, I think, is we want to be creative. It's no one of these, you know. So this idea of a hybrid design is what we want to keep in mind when we're thinking about retrofits and the idea of regionally specific hybrid assemblages of fuels, of energy, that make sense for this particular region. Wood is not going to be a big energy source in the desert and in semi-arid areas there are, but passive solar is going to be something that you're going to be able to do a ton of your work with. What I like to recommend for PV, for photovoltaic and, and passive and active systems, first of all is buying used because you'd be surprised how long these panels last. Arco built a bunch in the 80s that they thought would be kicked in five years that people are still using today and they're doing amazingly well and producing plenty of electricity. So I definitely recommend looking at use. If you have a lot of capital and you're looking and it's a new organization and some kind of big business complex, and you know, you might want to buy just last year's. But I wouldn't buy the latest new ones. I would definitely buy something that was at least one year old. In general, it's a better ecological choice to buy use than to buy new because new sends the message to the industry that they should continue to make more new products. When you buy used, 
you're buying from somebody who already bought that product and the industry isn't getting a piece of that. And so the producer isn't getting the economic incentive that, hey, I like what you're doing, keep making more photovoltaics. Instead, we're showing we as a population can continue to use stuff for a very long time and we can continue to recirculate it. So it's that idea of who are you giving economic incentive to and who do you want to give economic incentive to? And the first priority for site development is not going to be active energy systems because active energy systems produce hazardous waste when they're manufactured that may be toxic after you're dead and gone. The other thing about solar panels and the, thing, the cell that's happening around it is that it gives you absolutely no security if the grid's down if you've got grid-tied solar, which is what most people are recommending you have. All that that's doing is making you feel somewhat better about your electric and where it's coming from. It's not something that's, that's super accessible or easy. So even though it's a token feel-good green measure that a lot of people think is the first thing to do if they're doing the eco thing is, I'm going to put solar panels. I'm going to get solar. Start composting. <laughs> Grow some lettuce. <laughs>